Hi everyone, welcome to another video for the uh, Mixed Effect Modeling Workshop put on by the Center for Motor Control. Uh, in this video we're going to be talking about mixed effect models for longitudinal designs and we'll be following along hopefully exactly um, with chapter three uh, from the website that accompanies the workshop. Uh, so again this is just going to be kind of me talking through the script file and working through some of the more of the, the R issues rather than the statistical issues right that are discussed in more detail uh, in our meetings uh, together uh, and then also discussed in more detail in the website itself. So you can work through the website, you can follow along with the video, you know, or you could do one than the other, uh, but hopefully this will be a useful complement to some of the discussion that's going on in the website. Okay, so again, first what we're gonna do is in our studio, we're gonna go and open up the script file that corresponds to this session. So depending on where you save this on your computer, this should be los underscore mer underscore script underscore zero three. Um, and then again, we'll run the first line of code to import the relevant libraries that we want. So you need to install those packages if you haven't already. Uh, and otherwise the first line of code won't, won't work for you. And then the first uh, bit of data was just kind of opening up uh, and doing some processing to describe the, the data from the, the previous hypothetical study where we were, we were looking at um, uh, older adults and younger adults walking in different conditions and they had you know four different trials uh, and we were looking at kind of how quickly their, their walking speed changed in each of those conditions. For the example we're gonna look at today though, we're gonna import this other uh, data set from the web, uh, and I'm gonna put that up on here so that you can see it quickly. But in this study, what we were looking at, uh, or I should say these hypothetical data that are designed to, to mimic a real study, what we were looking at was uh, Roche scaled versions of the functional independence measure. Um, so the functional independence measure is a tool that's used in a lot of clinical and rehabilitation studies uh, that gives you a measure of a person's independence in the activities of daily living. And without getting into the details of precisely what Roche scaling means, we've essentially rescaled uh, this, this uh, measurement tool uh, to go from zero to 100, with 100 meaning greater levels of functional independence and zero meaning a complete dependence or a lack of independence. So uh, higher scores are better here. And then we're looking at how uh, the Roche scaled FIM score changes over time from month one you know, to about month 20 for individuals who had different types of spinal cord injuries, whether it was C1 to four, C5 to eight, or paraplegia. So in this example, we're going to be modeling how the Roche scaled FIM score changes over time for each of these individuals. And we have a few different options for how we can approach that, right? Building on from the lecture earlier, right? We have this, this time variable, which is actually given in months. Uh, to reduce some scaling issues, I'm going to convert months into years. So on line 37, that's what I'm doing, is to create a year.0 variable, where I center year on the first time point. Uh, and rather than looking at it in months, I'll divide by 12 to look at it in years. Uh, and then I'll also create a squared and a cubed version of that variable so we can test some higher order polynomials uh, for, for the effect of time. You could equivalently look at this as a scaled version of the time variable. So you could like Z transform it or at least mean center it uh, to create a variable called year.c. And then we, we, we could create uh, squared and cubed versions of that variable as well. Uh, for these examples, we're going to be looking at it with year centered on the first time point uh, because that helps make the intercept a little bit more interpretable. It's going to be the predicted FIM score at the very beginning of the study. But scaling the time variable does have a lot of very useful benefits, especially when you're adding in higher order polynomials because it can help reduce collinearity among your predictors. Um, but the, the main issue here is that if you do this kind of uh, mean centering or Z transforming, the intercept is no longer, or sorry, I should say, when x is zero, right, at the intercept, is no longer going to be at the beginning of the time variable, it's going to be at the average of the time variable. Uh, and so that is a useful thing to know, but it's not always what we want. Uh, and so that's why in these examples, we're gonna focus on where year being zero is the very first time point. Uh, but a useful exercise to actually go back through and rerun the same code using the centered version of the year variable, where year being zero is actually the mean time point. So having created those variables, let's go through the first steps, uh, if you remember from the lecture this morning, uh, where we were talking about creating unconditional time models. So our first unconditional time model is going to be a random intercepts model, where Roche scaled FIM scores are a dependent variable. We have a fixed effect of an intercept, and we have a random intercept for each subject. 
we can get a summary of that model and you can see it's actually a pretty a pretty simple model because there's not a lot going on here you can see the variance being captured by a random effect a pretty large standard deviation of the residuals that's left over and the intercepts not not surprisingly is statistically different from zero right a slightly more complicated model would be to create a random slopes random intercepts model uh, where we're going to have now fixed effects for both the intercept and the linear effect of time and we're going to have fixed or random effects for the intercept and the effect of time within each person. So we can create that random slopes random intercepts model and you can see it gets a little bit more complicated because now we have added in this variance component for the random effect and the correlation between the random slope and the random intercept. And that's an important thing to remember when you're adding random effects to your model is you're not just adding that variance component um, but most of the time, you're also adding in the covariance or the correlation between it and the other random effects. So there are ways you can specify that to have your random effects be independent of each other in R. But if you use this specification here, what you're going to have is the variance of the intercept, the variance of the slope, and their covariance. And that's really useful in a lot of longitudinal studies because often those things do become correlated. And you might have people, for instance, who have a high intercept who then tend to have a lower slope or vice versa due to, for instance, ceiling and floor effects in your data. Next, we can actually do the same thing with a quadratic model, right? So here on lines 67 through 74, we're just specifying fixed quadratic and random quadratic effects of time. And again, you can see now we're getting more and more complicated. And then we're taking it all the way up to a cubic model in lines uh, 76 through 84. Uh, we can run all of that together. And you can see now we have a, a pretty complicated random effect structure where again, not only do we have the variances for the intercept, the linear effect, the quadratic effect, and the cubic effect, but we have the covariances among all of those things. And actually, interestingly, we have uh, such a such a strong uh, correlation between our higher order effects of time. I'm a little surprised this model converged and we didn't actually get a warning here, because if these correlations ever go to one or if any of these variances go to zero, uh, uh, LME4 is going to give you a warning message that you have a singularity and a boundary condition in the estimation of your random effects components. Um, and if these things get too high, then what that usually is going to suggest is that your random effect structure is too complicated and you don't actually need one of these random effects in here. So for instance, although this is very high, um, we're, it, the model still converged, so we're gonna kind of move forward with testing it. But if this had gone to one and I got a convergence warning, what I would probably do is delete the cubic random effect uh, because that high correlation is telling me, well, that cubic random effect is actually already basically known because of the linear random effect or the quadratic random effect. And essentially, if you have two random effects that are so highly correlated, you probably only need one of them. Um, and what we would do in these situations where you have higher order effects of time is you'd keep the lower order effect rather than the, the higher order effect. So if you do get those kinds of convergence warnings or boundary warnings uh, in, your, in your mixed effect models, um, you know, uh, it's a good idea to think about simplifying your random effect structure and you would always remove higher order terms, right? You'd remove interaction terms first or you'd remove higher order polynomials uh, first. In this case though, because this model did in fact converge, what we can do is move forward with just statistically testing all of the unconditional models and seeing which one actually provides us with the better fit. Right, so by using the ANOVA function and then giving it the names of all of the different uh, 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 unconditional models that we created, we can actually get R to create an ANOVA table for us. Uh, and what we're gonna be really interested in here is this AIC column. And as you might remember from the other materials, right, or what's as it's described on the website, the AIC is the measure of model fit that we're really interested in. Uh, we prefer it to something like the deviance because the AIC actually introduces a penalty for, to avoid overfitting. Uh, and so what we're looking for is what gives us the lowest AIC and then we'll embrace that as the superior model. So as our models get more and more complicated, you can see we go from you know, three uh, parameters used to 15 parameters used, our AIC keeps going down and actually goes down pretty substantially if we're gonna compare the cubic random slopes model to the quadratic random slopes model. So the cubic random slopes model is definitely you know, our, our winner in this, in this situation. So we're gonna prefer that cubic random slopes model and we're gonna use that as the basis for our uh, uh, conditional models moving forward. 
so the next step then, right, as we talked about in the, in the workshop, is creating these conditional models. Uh, and so we're going to look at Roche scaled FIM scores, uh, and we're going to add in the interaction of AIS grade, which is our grouping variable, right? It tells us where you C1 to 4, C5 to 8, or paraplegic. Um, and we will look at that, inter that interaction with the linear effective time, the quadratic effective time, and the cubic effective time. But again, because these factors occur at the between subjects level, right? A person either uh, has, a paraple has paraplegia or a person has a C5 to 8 injury, right? Like you don't have both. That's a between subjects variable. So we don't have to do anything else with our random effects. We can just add these interactions into our model, having appropriately accounted for the variability within subjects with the random effects terms here. And then we'll have our between subject main effects of AIS grade and the cross level interactions of grade with time uh, in the model. So we can go ahead and run that code. It'll take a little bit longer for the model to, to uh, uh, fit um, on your computer because it's getting more and more complicated. And then what we can do as a starting point is use that ANOVA function again to compare our conditional model to the best fitting unconditional model. Um, and this is equivalent to you know, an omnibus F test of the overall model. Uh, and if adding in all of these fixed effects wasn't actually a statistically significant improvement, we probably wouldn't proceed any further uh, because what that's suggesting is that that's not a really good model. AIS grade didn't explain any variability above and beyond accounting for time by itself. In this circumstance, however, you can see that even though we add quite a few parameters, right, we're up to 23 now, the AIC continues to go down. Not by as much, it only went down by 30 points, um, but that's still a pretty decent reduction in the AIC. So let's use the ANOVA function on the individual model now, right? And you can get a, uh, a, a summary uh, ANOVA table. Uh, if, you have, if you're using the LMER test package, it will actually by default give you the type three analysis of variance table using Sater-Thwaites method to approximate these denominator degrees of freedom. And then it's going to give you F values and P values. Um, personally, though, I really like to use the capital A ANOVA function uh, from the Companion for Applied Regression package uh, because you can directly specify the type of sum of squared errors you want to use in that function. Uh, so, you know, it's great that the, the LME4 package gives this to us and some people might, you know, prefer and feel more comfortable with F values um, rather than chi-squared values. Uh, and these things will you know, differ a little bit in terms of the actual numbers that you're getting and the p-values that you're getting, but qualitatively they're going to agree uh, and these aren't going to be massively different. Uh, but I like to use this, this ANOVA function uh, from the car package for, for the, uh, these model objects because it gives us the type 3 walled uh, test of the deviance. So it, it keeps it kind of in the terms of the deviance. So this is the change in the deviance compared to a model that has that parameter in it versus a model that doesn't have that parameter in it. So this essentially tells you the deviance explained uh, for each of these variables, right? And then, and then we don't really have to worry about the denominator degrees of freedom in that case, because the chi-squared distribution just has a single degree of freedom, whereas the F distribution has two degrees of freedom. Um, but what we'll see is that we, we get a same pattern of statistically significant results where the, effect, the main effects of time and the main effect of AIS grade are all statistically significant. None of the time by grade interactions are statistically significant, right? And a same, the same situation down here in the uh, deviance table, we can see that we've got ma main effects of time and grade, but none of the interactions in our, in our uh, model are statistically significant. And finally, of course, if we really wanted to get into the details of the model, what the individual parameters were, exactly what the variances and the covariances of these different uh, parameters are, we could use the summary function to get a detailed description of the model output, um, which is going to be critical, especially if we want to see exactly what the model predicts in different situations, because then we would need to use these estimates, right, these slopes and intercepts uh, that we're getting here. Um, but for now, let's just scroll back up to our, our um, ANOVA output, right, or the analysis of deviance output, I should say, right, and, and, and kind of think about exactly what these things mean. We discussed some of this in the session this morning, but it's worth going over again, right, because we have a main effective year, which suggests that on average across groups, people changed linearly over time, right, and you can see, okay, consistently there is that, there is improvement over time in each of these th three groups. 
However, it's not just linear change because the main effects of quadratic time and cubic time were also statistically significant, which means that on average across groups, there's significant curvature to the shape of time. And specifically in this case, it looks like we get diminishing returns and the Roche scaled FIM scores improve at a much faster rate early on up to about you know six to eight months. And then the rate of improvement is significantly slowed down across all three of those groups. There's also a main effect of AIS grade, right? Which is equivalent to saying that there's an effect of grade on your intercepts. Grade affects where you start. And if you're in the C1 to 4 group, you tend to have a much lower uh, um, FIM score than people in the C5 to 8s. And, th and that tends to be much lower than the, the individuals with paraplegia, right? So we see differences in these groups based on where they start uh, in, in this study. Oh, sorry, we see, uh, we see d the, the group affecting where you start in this study, right? The area of your injury and the nature of your injury relates to the, the level of functional independence you might have at the beginning of this study. However, we don't really find any compelling evidence that the nature of the injury uh, leads to differences in how people change over time. And again, these are just simulated data, so we don't want to overinterpret this too much. Um, but I, the thing I want to emphasize here is that these are just not statistically significant. That's not the same as showing that these are the same or that they are no different. The rate of change in C1 to 4 is different than the rate of change in C5 to 8 is different than the rate of change for people with paraplegia, right? All of those time curves, if you actually fit that within each group, is slightly different. The differences just were not substantial enough to rise to the level of statistical significance in the current sample. Um, so the reason for that might be maybe they aren't that different after all, but the other reason for that might be maybe we didn't actually have really good statistical power for testing those interactions to begin with. Right? And we'd have to do a proper power analysis in order to understand that and be able to interpret that, non that, that null result uh, more, more robustly. Um, so I know there's probably a lot of other questions kind of swimming around in terms of implementing this code and what it means and adapting it to your own circumstance. Right? There's also a lot of things that we didn't really touch on here in terms of regression diagnostics. You know, how do I check the normality of my residuals? How do I check the normality of my random effects? Uh, there are some other videos that I, I, I will provide the links to that people can, can look at there. Um, you know, you can also just kind of go through my, my YouTube videos to look at uh, uh, the videos from uh, the, uh, the American Congress for Rehab Medicine, where Al Kozlowski and I have presented a workshop on this topic. Right, so there's, there's more detailed information that you will need to pull out from other sources. But hopefully the website, working through the script file, and this video will put you in a nice position where you have a solid foundation for being able to go out into the world and start applying these longitudinal mixed models to your own data.